All right, guys, I appreciate you clicking on this video. This is going to be a sonar for dummies. This is for people who have never used a fish finder yet or maybe are new to it or, I don't know, maybe just need a refresher course. Uh, a lot of guys ask for this, and uh, I hope this helps you out. So let's get started. I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible, and I'll add more to these as we go, getting a little more complex each time. So let's start out with the colors we're seeing here. Uh, the reason a color fish finder is so much better than an old monochrome or a, you know, a liquid crystal with the, have the, you know, the grayscale is because we can tell the intensity of our returns. Now, what's a return? A return is anything on the screen, okay? If you look where all the colors are on this screen, from the top to the bottom, you see yellow at the top and you see yellow and red at the bottom and blue. Basically, uh, three quarters to the left of the screen. That's all a history. Okay, that's things we passed over or things that have passed under our transducer, and that's the history. Okay, that's just telling us what we already passed over. Towards the right, you're going to see a gray bar. Okay, you see a zero here at the top. Between that zero and the 40 at the bottom, there's a gray bar. It's kind of jagged on the right side, but smooth on the left. That's our A scope. All newer fish finders have an A scope you can turn on. It doesn't matter what brand you have. This is a Simrad NSS Evo 3. The Lawrence units have them as well. Turn your A-scope on. That's really going to help you learn what's happening here. So you're going to see the yellow at the top. That's our surface. And the reason all, that, all those returns are up there is because the surface gets churned up as we're moving. Waves churn it up. Our prop churns it up. Lots of things are floating in the surface. You know, pine needles, uh, pollen, leaves, whatever. So all that clutter up there is just stuff that's, you know, churned up. It's just noise on the surface. You could pretty much ignore that. There are settings to remove that, but I wouldn't remove that until you get really good with your fish finder because sometimes bait is very close to the surface and we don't want to lose those. So basically that's what that is. Let's jump to the bottom. Now on the very bottom of the screen, you're going to see a very hard yellow bar. That is our bottom. That's just the bottom of the water right there. That's the bottom of the lake, river, ocean, whatever you see. That's the hard bottom. Now there are different palettes in your fish finder. Palette is just an assortment of colors you choose. This is one of my favorite palettes. Uh, it's just easier to see for me. It's a Lowrance color. It's one of the older colors, and it's here with the Simrad as well. And uh, if we look at our bottom right away, we see yellow. So that means our hardest returns are going to be yellow. The biggest fish, hard rocks, uh, anything that is large and strong in the water will be yellow. So that tells us if we're looking for fish, we want to see that yellow. We're looking for big fish. That yellow is good, right? And you can see it fade down eventually to white at the bottom. It goes to that reddish orange, then to blue, then to white. So blue is the weakest return and white is no return. So that tells us a lot. You know, as we see our fish in the water, if we see yellow, we know it's a bigger fish probably. Or it's just in, a, in the center of the cone of the transducer and it's uh, absorbing a lot more energy. So it looks brighter. Again, I'm trying to keep this simple uh, as I can. I hope I'm not, you know, giving you too much info, but let's talk about how sonar works. All right, we have a transducer. It's either mounted on the transom or it's through the hull or it's in the hull. This here is a through hull. It doesn't matter. They all work the same basically when you're moving slowly, okay? The way a transducer works is it sends a signal straight down from the transducer. It's facing down, so it's going to send a signal or a ping or a pulse, whatever you want to call it, straight down to the bottom. When it hits the bottom, it's going to bounce up come right back to the transducer. Anything that interrupted that pulse's travel will show up in your A-scope there. The A-scope is what's under your transducer right this second. It's now, it's real time. So you'll see different color dashes in there. The colors, again, tell us the strength of the return. Yellow is the strongest, blue is the weakest, and that reddish orange is in between. So the transducer tells you what's under the boat right now in that A-scope. Anything to the left of that A-scope is a history. That's stuff we've already passed by. Your transducer, the way it behaves, it shines down like a flashlight would. So if you shine a flashlight and you put your hand right up to it, you'll see a you know, small circle on your hand of light. If you look at that same light on a barn door that's maybe 50 feet away, it's a giant circle, right? Well, your transducer behaves the same way. It shines straight down, it gets wider as it goes. So you may see like even in this, shot here you see a lot more fish towards the bottom than the top there might be just as many fish all the way through this water column but because your transducer is so narrow at the top it's not going to have as many returns nothing not as many fish are going to break the beam because the beam is narrower 
So you got to keep that in mind. When you're uh, deeper you are, the wider your cone, the more things you're going to interrupt the pulse or the ping, so the more returns you're going to get. All right, let's talk about the shape of the returns. You're going to see they look like arches. If your fish finder is set up correctly and you're moving four, five, six miles an hour, you should see arches like this. If you're getting half arches, your transducer may need to be adjusted. So an arch. Why an arch? Well, the hardest return you're going to get from a fish is from their air bladder. Now, with these new transducers these days and the new uh, you know, high-tech chirp sonar, we don't need the air bladder like we did. We still mark the fish itself, but the air bladder really helps. It gives you a really sharp return, very high contrast. So it looks like an arch because as we're moving, say that, let's say the fish are still in this situa situation. Where the, your, your, your transducer beam or pulse aiming straight down. It's going up the fish's air bladder and down the other side. So you can see it looks like an arch. And it looks like an arch because we're moving. We're up and down. We're right across the fish and we keep moving. If your returns are very long and wormy, it usually happens and it usually means we're going slow or the fish is just inside the pulse of your transducer for a longer period of time. So if you're sitting still, if we were going zero miles an hour here, all these would look like worms. Okay, they wouldn't look like arches. So fish look like arches when we're moving and they look like long, thin worms when we're sitting still. Very important to know. Sometimes you can look at it and say, wow, those are huge fish. They may not be. If you're going very slow, chances are it's just getting returned, you know, sending return marks back over and over and over and over again. And it's just sitting under your transducer, absorbing all that energy. And the history makes it look like it's very long because it's just sitting there under your transducer. So those are good things to know. Also, the strength of the return. You'll see some of these returns here. Some of these arches have yellow in them. Okay, if I see a lot of arches with yellow, that's a good sign. It usually means they're bigger fish. In this case, I know this was a lot of bait. I just know because we were netting it, we were catching it. So you see a yellow inside a return, that's a good sign. If you see a lot of arches with yellow, chances are those are bigger fish, stronger returns. Now you're going to see some of these only have the orangish, red, or the blue. It could mean a few things. It could mean they're smaller fish, or it could mean it's near the edge of the cone of your transducer. So it's giving you a weaker signal. They could be, every one of these fish could be the exact same size here. They, and you know, if they're all in the same position on your transducer, they would all be yellow. But they're not all in the same area of the transducer. Some are on the edge, some are on the center. If they're in the center, they're more yellow. If they're on the edge, they're more blue and reddish. I hope that's not too confusing. But that's the way, that's the way the transducer works. More information you'll see over here to the left, we have our depth. And then below that, we have our temperature. It says 59.0 degrees Fahrenheit. That is the temperature at the water the transducer is sitting in. So that transducer is maybe a foot into the water. That is the surface temperature of the water within a foot of the surface. Right where the transducer is, that's the temperature. It's not the temperature any further down into the water column. Okay. Below that, we have our frequency. That is the frequency our transducer is operating at. I have some other videos on chirp frequencies and swept frequencies and stuff you can look through if you like but uh, typically the higher the frequency the narrower the cone so if it's a 200 frequency chances are your cone is narrower and if it's a lower like a 50 or an 83 chances are your cone is wider if i'm searching for fish on plain or in open water i generally like a wider cone okay hope this helps you guys out if you have any questions please put them there in the comments i'll be happy to answer every single one and I'm going to uh, slowly increase the amount of uh, information I'll add here in this uh, Sonar for Dummies series. And I'm adding the regular uh, screenshots as well. So I appreciate you guys watching. Please subscribe if you haven't and ring that little bell to make sure you get alerts. And I'll keep these going for you guys. If you uh, have any other questions, feel free to ask. I appreciate you watching. Love you. Mean it. Hey guys, thanks for clicking on this one. This is the second video in the series, Sonar for Dummies. If you haven't seen the first video, I definitely recommend checking it out. I will put a link to it in the description here. And I'll put a link to this video here in that description so you can find your way back. All right, let's get started on this one. You know, each, each time I add a video to this series, I'm going to add a little more information using more and more complex screenshots as we go. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments. I'll be happy to answer them all. All right, let's get started on this. Right away, we're gonna start with some bait. You can see we have three clouds of bait here. Uh, you can see they are bright yellow. They have all the colors of our uh, palette there. So we can see it's uh, 
bright yellow in the center, that means it is a very dense school of bait. It's probably tiny bait. It is threadfin shad. I know that while well, we were netting it and it was very tiny. So when you see a very dense school like this, chance starts very tiny, tiny bait because they're very small bait. They can get super close together and all their air bladders kind of, you know, you know, blend all together as one and it looks like one solid mass. So that's a good way to determine the size of your bait. If you have a nice thick cloud like that, chance starts small bait. Okay. Now, if that was close to the bottom, it can be confusing. Sometimes you're not sure if it's a tree or a bush. A really great way to tell is you look at the top edge of the bait school. Now, if you look at the top edge here, it's very smooth. That usually means it's a school of bait. If it's rough on the top, it can be a tree or a bush, and you'll see it's smooth on the top and rough on the bottom. Nine times out of ten, that is a school of bait. So that's what you want to look for. All right, just below that, we're going to see a bunch of arches here. These are all our fish. These are fish that are just keying on that bait. This would be a great place to fish because the fish that we're marking aren't just hanging out. They are there to feed. They're underneath the bait. You can see right here, they're actually touching the schools of bait. They're right up in there. And, uh, you know, also when you see tight schools of bait like this, it usually means there are fish nearby and these bait schools are really staying tight together. Now, if we saw these bait schools all busted up and loose, that's even a better sign. Usually, it usually means that the fish are thrashing through and breaking them all up. So you can learn a lot about what's going on just by the condition of your bait schools. Something to really pay attention to, you know. All right, our arches are really pretty. They're almost perfectly symmetrical. That means our transducer is set up properly. If our transducer is a little crooked or if it's tilted up or down too much, we'll get half arches, like check marks, you know. So here we have nice full arches, so we know our transducer is nice and level. So we have our bait schools here. We have our arches. Let's look all the way up to the left here. A little bit shallow water. You can see two bumps on the bottom. Those are stumps, okay? And we can tell that they are stumps. It's not bait. It is not fish because there is no separation you can see it's connected to the bottom so when you see a hard return like that uh, 99 out of 100 times it will be a hard piece of structure a rock you know boulder stump whatever and we know it's not bait because for one it's connected to the bottom and for two you see the top is rough the top edge is rough that means it is probably not a bait school that's not true all the time, but most of the time, if it's nice and smooth on the top, it is a bait school. So, so we have no separation on the bottom. That tells us it's a stump or a rock. Now, if you look at these arches here close to the bottom, they look like those stumps. The only difference is we do see space between the arch and the bottom. So that tells us it's a fish. Now, even if you're a flounder fisherman, right, and your flounder are laying or your fluke are laying right on the bottom. I mean, they're touching the bottom, they're squeezed to the bottom as tight as they can get. You'll still see a space there because that air bladder is a little bit off the bottom. And some of the older transducers won't pick it up as well. But today's you know new transducers, especially the Airmark Chirp transducers, the technology is so good that it really picks that air bladder up nice. So we can see those arches in the bottom. They do have separation off the bottom and they are fish. All right. Now, if you look down here, you're going to see a blue haze at the bottom between 30 feet and 40 feet of water. That blue haze, that is a thermocline or a section of our thermocline. That is colder water. It is cold water. It is dense water. It is more dense than the water above it. So it actually tricks the transducer into thinking, you know, there's something there, some return there. So that blue haze is our cold, dense water. That's a section of our thermocline. Okay. It also helps with what helps us fishing because I won't fish in or below a thermocline. Uh, there's not much dissolved oxygen down there, although you can catch fish there and mark fish, fish there. I'm looking for active fish that are happy and they are feeding. So I avoid a thermocline. Just a little side note there. All right. One last thing on this screenshot. You're going to see a second bottom we're marking here in the bottom left corner. If we set our range far enough you can see we're in 38 feet of water but the range is set to 60 feet here that will show our second bottom now if you set the range far enough you could pretty much always get to a second bottom where you can see some type of second bottom it's just a quick way to check our bottom density or our hardness so here our second bottom is very far from our real bottom so that tells us it's a relatively soft bottom clay mud 
it is not a hard bottom. So if our second bottom was very close, let's say an inch from our real bottom, that would probably mean it's a rocky or very hard bottom. So that's also a nice little tool there, a little something to uh, mess with when you're on the water and play with your, you know, your uh, settings when you're out there. You won't hurt it. You know, play with your range. A lot of machines today, you can throw them in auto and they do fine. So you can always go back to auto if you're in trouble. But hope you guys uh, dig this one. Like I said in the uh, sonar for dummies, I'm going to add more and more each time. I put up a screenshot with a little more information each time. If you have any questions or comments, please throw them in the comments below. And please give me a thumbs up. It really helps these videos do well. And it tells me that you like them. So I'll do more and more. Please subscribe if you haven't. Thanks for watching. Stay safe on the water. Love you guys. Mean it. Hey guys, thanks for clicking on this one. This is the third installment of our Sonar for Dummies series. If you haven't seen the first two, I definitely recommend checking those out. I will put the links to those down here in the description. Definitely go watch the first one if you haven't seen that. It'll make this one a whole lot easier to digest. All right, this is a really cool shot. I love this screenshot. You may have seen me use this one before. It tells a fantastic story all in one shot, and it has some information that will really help you out if you're new to Sonar. Uh, so let's get started on this one. All right, so you're going to see here all, a whole lot of different sizes and shapes to these returns, okay? These are all the exact same size fish, more or less. We were in a creek channel here, and I was netting shad. They were small in the 3-inch to 5-inch range. We were netting them, so I know the size. And what I did was I ran over them on plane, and then I dropped off a plane just to see how they would look different, okay? So... If we talked about a little bit on our first session there about how the ping works, right? Our transducer sends a ping down and the transducer waits for it to return. When the ping bounces back up, anything that interrupts that ping will show up as a return, right? So the returns on the left here are little tiny dots. The reason they're little tiny dots is we were running 40 miles an hour, okay? So we're on plane, plane speed. Because we're going so fast, our transducer is moving so fast, each little fish, each little shad, only had a chance to maybe absorb one ping. For argument's sake, let's say they, they absorbed one ping, okay? So we're cruising quick, one ping hits it, and it shows up as one little dot. So they all look like little dots. Simple as, as that, really. If you look towards the bottom here on the left side, you'll see those two little arches down here. Those are probably catfish, lots of catfish here in this lake, probably in the four to five pound range. So you can see, how an arch, even a bigger fish, won't really look like an arch at that speed. It still looks more like, more or less like a dot. I call them light bulbs at that speed. Then in the middle, we're slowing down. We're at about 10 miles an hour, 15, you know, dropping off a plane. And you can see those nice, beautiful arches, the arches that everyone wants to see, right? When your fish finder looks great. And then to the right, we are at a crawl. We're down to eight tenths of a mile an hour. So our returns look nice and long, okay? They look wormy, right? So let's back over here to the left again to the left dotted line. You're gonna see the transition where we go from those little dots to little tiny arches, then the medium sized arches moving to the right, and then finally our worms all the way to the right, okay? And that transition where it goes to from dots to arches, we're dropping off a plane, we're going from 40 miles an hour down to 15 to eventually 10, and the arch looks that way in the middle there because we're cruising at about 10 miles an hour, Although the transducer is moving fast, it's not moving lightning fast. So because it's slower, each fish can absorb a little more energy from the transducer. So it's getting hit with more pings. So the pings move up the fish, up the air bladder, and down the other side of the air bladder as the transducer moves over those shad. So we'll have to picture the shad are standing still. Our transducer is moving over them. The pings are going up and down the air bladder and gives us a nice arch going about 10 miles an hour. So for argument's sake, if the left returns were absorbing one ping, let's say in the middle there was absorbing maybe 20 pings. Okay, moving to the right, again, this is all for argument's sake. To the right of the furthest right dotted line, you see how they look like worms now. They're very flattened out. They're flattened out because they're sitting under the transducer longer. So if the returns all the way to the left are absorbing one ping, for argument's sake, the ones on the right may be absorbing 100. So those returns are just sitting under the transducer longer because we're crawling. We're moving our transducer so much slower that we're hitting each fish with more and more pings. So the history 
as the history scrolls from right to left, it shows every ping, right? So if it was pinged 100 times, it's going to look like a long worm. So that's very important to keep that in mind all the time, really. If you're running on plane, if you're anchored, if you're drifting, if you're on trolling speed, how each return can look different. If you're trolling, the arches you're going to see are going to be more like the arches we're looking at in the middle. Okay, anywhere from that, you know, five to ten miles an hour. If we're just drifting or even anchored, we can have the arches on the right side of the screen where they look long and flat. They can even look perfectly flat and long worm like. I've had them go all the way across the screen, just one arch, one long worm all the way across the screen. Just because that fish is sitting under the transducer and absorbing ping after ping after ping, so the history makes it look like it's a it's like a long, long, you know, uh, water serpent, right? Like Nessie or something. But it could be a small fish. In this case, it's a three to five inch shad, but it can look enormous if it's just sitting under your transducer. All the way to the left, we're running on plane, so we're looking for dots. So, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me, they'll say, you know, I'm running on plane and I just can't see fish when I'm on plane. It's probably because you're looking for arches and you're really not going to see arches at 40 miles an hour. Like I said, even down here where those two catfish are, they're not arches. Even though those are decent sized fish, if you look very close, they resemble, they start to kind of look like an arch, but it's just a dash. So chances are you are marking fish. You're just uh, looking for the arch instead of just a little dot or dash or what I call a light bulb. So this is a great tool to put in your arsenal, understanding your sonar. I hope this one helped you guys out. Please shoot a like on this one and subscribe if you haven't. Putting a like on these videos really does help me out. And I appreciate if you take a second to do that. It lets me know that you guys want more of these. Please stay safe on the water and leave a few for me. Love you, mean it. All right, guys, here we go. This is the fourth video in the Sonar for Dummy series. Got so much positive feedback from this. So I'm going to keep it going. Try to do one at least uh, one a week. It's tough. I'm fishing a lot right now, but I'm definitely going to try my best. So here we go. All right. This is a great shot here. It kind of uh, gives examples of the things that we talked about in the first three videos. Right away, you're going to see a giant worm across the screen. Remember we talked about sending a ping down and the ping bounces off the bottom. And anything that interrupts the ping shows up as a return. And we spoke about, you know, if you go over the fish really fast, the boat is moving fast. You may only hit the fish with one ping, so you only get like one little dot on the screen. And when a fish spends a lot of time under the transducer, it can absorb a lot of pings. So the history makes it look like it's a giant fish, but it's not. It's one fish who's just sitting under your transducer, and we're just pinging the heck out of them, you know, over and over again. So you can see this one long worm here. There's several, but this one here. Check this one out. Now you could see as the fish is moving around under the boat, like right here, the return here in the history is yellow. So that is our strongest return, right? Because uh, bottom is yellow, which is our strongest return. So we relate that, right? Yellow is our strongest return in this palette. So you can see where it's yellow right here. And then uh, as it's moving to the right here, which is closer to our present time, it weakens in signal. But the fish really has only moved down a few feet. So why is it weak? Well, it probably moved to the left or to the right and is now at the edge of the cone. So when it's at the edge of the cone, it uh, you know doesn't absorb as much energy and it shows as a weaker signal. It doesn't mean the fish is any smaller. you know. So when you see a school of fish and the arches can look all different sizes or all different colors, uh, it doesn't mean they're smaller fish. It just means they're probably at the edge of the cone uh, that the transducer is sending down. So the ping is probably just barely getting them. So you can see this fish was definitely moving around down there. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about what we're seeing here. If you look in our A scope, you know, we see our marks here. We got a lot of yellow and down by the bottom, some of the pink color, you know, the reddish. Uh, just That's just all fish that are sitting right under the boat. Now at this time, the boat is doing zero miles an hour. We have the anchor lock set on our motor guide. So the trolling motor is just sitting the boat perfectly still. And we're over the school of stripers and we're jigging them up. So if you see all these zigzags up and down, you'll see one here. And then you'll see a lighter one down here to the left in light blue. We had three or four guys uh, working jigs up and down under the boat. So that's what that is. That's the jigs going up and down. Now make sure you stay till the end of this one because I have a video, a live video of this exact screenshot happening. And I talk about what is actually happening under the boat. So that's pretty, pretty cool. 
And uh, all right, so let's see here. We got our zigzags going up and down. That's our jig going up and down. And again, back to this one fish here, this one long worm. If you notice, he's right along that zigzag up and down. That fish came up from the bottom. If you look all the way to the left here, that fish was on the bottom and it came up and it looked at the jig and it hung with the jig the whole time we were jigging it. Never did bite it, but it was very interested in it. You can see how it stayed right with that jig and we'll see that in the video as well. Now you'll see down here is a whole school of stripers. They're just very interested in that jig and you can see how whoever was working that jig at this point right here, they saw the school of fish on the screen and dropped the jig. So I dropped it probably 10 feet or so from 20 to 30 feet to try to get in that school and, you know, talk him into eating. So uh, that's what that is. You can see the jig moving down. Now, if we just went by the A-scope here, man, it would be so hard to determine that's what was happening. But you can see how that history scrolls from right to left. It just paints such a beautiful picture, you know, and shows really what was happening. Also at the top here, you're going to see this haze, this very thick haze. We were in a mouth of a creek and we had a lot of rain and it washed all the pollen and everything down. There was a haze on top of the water. So that's what that is. That's just a thick pollen that was just sitting in the top, you know, 10 or 15 feet of water. So uh, let's go to the live footage here of us on the water. And uh, it was really cool because I was fishing with a buddy and his wife was with us and she's actually a, a really experienced fisherman but she's more of a largemouth bass fisherman who's you know cast and pound the banks a lot and she didn't have a lot of experience with a fish finder so i wasn't going to do a fish finder video we were just jigging and uh she happened to ask me some really good questions while we were out there she said all right what am i looking at here and while i explained what was going on i realized that i had some really good footage at the end of the day so i'm gonna put this one up here and i think it's a, a pretty good one pretty strong so uh, again if you have any comments please put them down there if you want to see a, a particular screenshot or if you have specific questions I'll do my best to answer every single one if you haven't subscribed please subscribe and ring the little bell so you get notifications and shoot a like on this if you hit the little thumbs up it really helps me out and it also lets me know that you want more of these videos and just a real quick note man I can't tell you how much I appreciate that I got so many views on this and really nobody complained about the title uh, sonar for dummies. I love that about the fishing crew, man. I just love that all about the fishing guys. That's why I always call them brothers. You know, we're family for sure. And I just love that no one cried about it. Fishing for dummies. I mean, you know, sonar for dummies, the four dummies uh, title has been used for years. It just means learning made easy. And I love that nobody complained about it. It's so cool about you guys. All right, man. Enjoy. I hope this helps out and keep looking for more of these. Check back for sure. Love you. Mean it. Stay safe out there. They're curious. They are coming right up. Look at that. There's. I don't know. What I'm if you go off to the side too. Right? These two right here just came right up to look oh. at that jig. Someone's jigging up and down, and these two came right up to look at it. There's another one in the mix. That still be the same one, but basically, you see this section here that's all fluttery. That's directly under us right this second. This is just a history, but that's what's under the boat right now. And they're hanging there. They're hanging there, we're gonna hang here. So you'll see, like, if you look at it and feel what you're doing, you can figure out which jig is yours. Yours is going down, that what, now stop. Okay, that's you right there. See how it just stopped? Okay. And now drop it, and you'll see it go down. So now when the fish comes up, you can figure out if he's looking at yours or... I believe this fish here was just looking at yours the whole time you were jigging it. See him? He's very interested in your bait. <laughs> That's right. Look at that. that. That fish is coming up fast right there. Three or three or four of them, two or three. Someone's gonna whack one right there. They're racing up to get it. Racing up to get it. Right back down. Right back down. All right, you see we're here. It's summertime, so these fish are deep. The water's warm, 82 degrees. These are the jigs working up and down. These are striped bass in the small three to five pound range, maybe some up to seven, eight pounds, 30 inches. And you can see our jig here. It's enough to entice these fish to come up and look, but they're not hitting it. And it's, a, yeah, it's midday. Sometimes these fish have just been eating all morning. You know, they're gorged out chasing these baits. And we just need to wait for them to get hungry or figure out 
what we can do to make it irresistible to them. But an hour or two before dark, when it comes time to strap the feed bag on, is usually enough. But the more fish in the mix, the better, not for obvious reasons. But you get more fish in there, a bigger group will tend to eat when they're not hungry if there's more, more fish around. The old competition factor, you know. But we have the spot lock or the uh, anchor lock, the motor guide anchor lock, just holding us right here. And that's all we can do. We're just going to work and figure out what they're going to not be able to pass up. I got the crew, though. Look at all kinds of iron going down there. Look at these. Mm. Come right up. This fish is just, so you can see here and here, it was just completely infatuated with this jig going up and down. Trying to figure it out, but just doesn't want to take it. You can see it come up. It's looking at it, it's just sitting. That fish is just sitting right under that jig. Come and get it. Drop it right on its head. Drop it right on its head. It's something. Give me a headache. There you go. <laughs> Look at that. Screenshot. Thanks for clicking on this one guys. This is the fourth video in the Sonar for Dummy series. It has proven to be pretty popular, so I'm going to keep it rolling for you guys. If you have anything specific you'd like to see in one of these videos, please put it in the comments. If you have any questions, please put those in the comments as well. I do my best to answer every single one. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, I'd appreciate it if you would. And shoot a thumbs up on this video because it tells me you want more of these. And it also helps me out. So let's get started on this one. This one is how we pinpoint fish that we mark on our sonar. Uh, first of all, you have to do this when the fish are deeper. You know, the deeper the fish are, the easier it is for you to do this because your cone from your transducer gets wider as the water gets deeper. So you are able to see these fish a whole lot better when they are down deeper. Uh, typically summertime, you know, in fresh water. So this is from a lake right here. You can see pretty deep, 133 feet. All of these horizontal lines you see, those are our baits. So that is the lead line, you know, the lead uh, weight with our live herring swimming uh, on the hook. So right here, you're going to see a pretty heavy line. And right under it, you're going to see a thinner line. Uh, right there, you can see it kind of goes up and down. These little thin blue lines are the herring. That's just the herring swimming along that's on our hook. We have a you know, pretty long leader here, several feet, so the herring can swim around. So the stable lines that you see are the lead weights, and the, the little faint blue lines that move up and down are our herring. So you can kind of use what you know about that to pinpoint these exact fish that are feeding. So you can see the arches. Arches that zigzag up and down like this are good news. That means these fish are active, they're looking for bait, they're responding to your bait, and we caught quite a few fish this day. So in this video, right after this shot, you're going to see how we pinpoint the exact fish we see on the sonar and work to catch that exact fish. So stay with this one. You're going to see some really cool uh, you know, instances on how we use sonar to pinpoint individual fish, even some side scan stuff in this one. So I appreciate you guys watching. If you haven't seen the first four videos in this series, I'll put the links here in the description. I would definitely watch those first because it'll all make more and more sense if you watch them in order. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you watching. Love the support. Can't thank you guys enough. Stay safe on the water. Leave a few from me. Love you. Mean it. All right, here we go. We are on a lake here. We are over deep water. We're fishing four down lines with herring, live herring on them. We are only fishing four lines so we can keep track of all four on the fish finder. So we can watch all four lines at once and see when a fish is interested and adjust the line accordingly. With 113 feet or whatever, you know, we have a lot of room for up and down. You know, if you're just a few feet below the fish, you won't hook up. You got to be slightly over the fish. Sometimes you got to be right on top of them. Sometimes these deep fish are not feeding, but they will take a bait if you whack them right in the face with it. So this is a very effective way of catching those fish. So what you're going to see here is a guy with a visor on. He's sitting down. That's Joey. Okay, behind the helm is myself and my buddy Steve, Striper Steve Knight. So we're watching the screen. Steve tells Joey to drop 
his bait he can see his bait go down to a mark you know a nice arch fish doesn't look he tells Joey to drop it again on that arch and he hooks up so let's check this out right now as it goes it's very 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 good stuff right here and you can really see how effective your fish finder can be in deep water Alright, this is what I'm happened. I'm trying to get the dang thing. I want to show you in the screen what just happened Take here. Take them on up there around that troll motor so they don't wipe out that other rod over there. Come on up here. They're way down around that motor. Steve was looking at these two fish right here. And Joe had this line right here. And Steve goes, drop it. And he saw these two. So he dropped it. Leveled out. He says, drop it again. He dropped it and went right, bunked that, that fish right in the head. You can see right here. That fish just said, "What? I want it. He hooked up, and that's him bringing it up. And he's hooked up right now. Same exact thing just happened. <laughs> There's that fish right there. I'm telling you, it's not the same one. This was the first one. And that's the one that just happened now. Nope, he's getting underneath, going underneath that motor over here. He's going to wipe these other ones out. You can go all the way around. That's it. You're doing good. Way down in the water. You grab that line. We can all do it. It'll be a team effort. <laughs> I just uh, brought that bait up from here, right up into these stripers we came across. We just brought it up to here, and he saw that fish come and look at it. From here, went and came and looked at it. Look at him. Chase that bait. These are, leaders are a little long, so they can chase them all over the place. Right. There's a good one right there. Come on. Come on. Come on. There he is. Oh, get it out. Get it out. Get it out. Nice. There you go. There you go, nice. All right, I had a lot of requests for some side scan stuff. So I'm gonna start with this one here. I'll add some more later on, but this is a great example how side scan is so important uh, for, for what I do anyway. If you're, you know, fish any uh, water less than 150 feet, it is uh, extremely useful. So right now I'm looking at the screen. Normally we'd be casting our baits up to the bank, right? That's your natural, you know, kind of instinct. But I look at the screen and I see that they're on the deep side. I'm marking some fish out near the main river channel on the deep side. So instead of pounding the bank, we go ahead and cast on the left side and we caught those fish. Now it was a very slow day. We only caught a few fish all day long and little things like this are just invaluable, you know. So uh, let's watch this one go on and you'll see it few nice fish here caught because of side scam oh yeah Shout I'm me. pointing those fish out to Zach right there and you can see here on the screenshot those four striped bass that you can see and those are the shadows and lower on the screen you can see the shadows off to the left now we're not marking those fish which means they were probably higher in the water column and we only saw the shadows I'm gonna add some more side scan videos to this and our sonar for dummies to uh, you know, break all this stuff down further. But you can see how, just by taking a quick look here, we saw those fish out to the left side, we cast it out there, and we caught fish. Such a great tool. Yeah, uh, that was a bite. Just had a bite. It was probably about 15 or 20 foot out from the boat where that one hit. There he is, striper. Got him. Nice. Peel and drag off. <laughs> They're the ones we marked, bro. Peel and drag. That ain't no bad uh, green bass. <laughs> I 
It must be just off the end of that point. Look, Look at that. there they are. Yeah. Got a little side scan, huh? Holy cow, you're not kidding me. <laughs> this is no five pounder, son. Man, he's really cool. He sure as hell is, bro. Hey. I really. He's moving a little too quick. Oh, you gotta love that, dude. You just gotta love it. Blue and silver. BKD. Really good looking fish, man. Hmm, about a 24 inch fish. Beautiful. Okay, we are fluke fishing here in Long Island. And you can see, that's what fluke looked like on the bottom. See that color there that's just above the green? We just passed over it. I'm gonna back up. You see it's a solid bottom here, the whole way. And these are sand eels right here. And that's fluke on the bottom, right underneath those sand eels. That's that air bladder gives them away. Even though they're hanging really close to the bottom, on the bottom, like they're part of the bottom, that air bladder always gives them away. And with this chirp sonar, with this Evo 2, this Simrad Evo 2, man, you're not going to get away. And there you go. He just caught that fish. All right. Oh, that's, that's look, he, just, is, uh, he just lost that fluke, and here he is going right down to the bottom. That Simrad is, is, a, is a maniac. Look at this display, Dre. Check this out. That's that fluke going back down to the bottom. Really? Yep. Here, yeah, here is where... Here's where the fluke was, yeah. and it, these two thin lines, yeah. that's his jig, okay? This is the fish coming up to look at the bait. That's the fish coming up to look at the bait. One of these, he bit it. I'm uh -huh. gonna say it's that one, because that's later. He fought the fish up, so he fought the fish up, and that's where the hey, fish came off. Oh, wow, he yeah, went, he shot straight to the bottom like an arrow. Hey guys, thanks for clicking on this one. This is lesson six in the Sonar for Dummies series. I'm going to put the links to the first five down in the description because it will definitely help if you watch those first. I'm not going to talk for very long. I'm going to get right to the video. I have some really good video here. The most common comment I receive is, where is the fish after it leaves my A-scope? How do I catch that fish? Where exactly is it? In this video, I'm going to tell you everything I know about that and how to find that fish. We have more technology than ever before. And the only time we truly know where that fish is, is when it's in the A-scope. After that, it's just in the history, and that's a moment in time. It's not a moment in distance. But our technology is fantastic these days, and in this video, I'll show you exactly how to keep an eye on those fish and how to track them as best you can. Thanks for watching, guys. Let's get to it right now. Please subscribe if you haven't, and give it a thumbs up. It really helps me out, guys. Love you. Mean it. That was a school of white bass right there. But if you want to set a waypoint on it, you can just touch it. Hit your check mark waypoint that cursor and now we have a mark on it come over to our chart and there it is that's that waypoint right there so the most common question I get about a fish finder is after you pass over a fish they want to know where that fish is and it's kind of hard to describe you got to keep in mind that after you mark a fish Anything that's in the history is just a picture of what you passed over. The scroll speed has nothing to do with where those fish are. Imagine if all the fish are on the screen, you take a screenshot, and now that screenshot just moves over to the left and out of your way. That's what your history is. It has nothing to do with where the fish are. It's just a moment in time. So everything that's in the, the A-scope here is directly under the boat now. Once it's past that A-scope, this is just a history. It's just a picture of what happened. That does not help us at all finding the fish. The quickest way and easiest way to find out exactly where those fish are. Look at this, a boat coming in between both of those. The easiest way to find those fish is touch the screen. You just touch the screen here on those marks. That fish is 107, that mark is 112, 117. See, it's getting further and further away from us. But now we know where that mark was. Doesn't help a whole lot because we don't that fish is swimming. You know, we don't know where that fish is, but we're using it to find isolated schools. So 
it's quite difficult to know what happens when the fish leaves the A-scope. We don't know where that fish is. There's really no quick answer for you. All we know is what's in the A-scope right now. Once it leaves us, it's just a picture that's moving away. It's just a still picture that's moving away from us. This may help you here determine where these fish are after you've passed over them. All the Simrads are like this, and I believe most of the late model Lorances are the same. You just touch on any mark here and it tells you where that mark was. So you can see it, the number is 175 and it's growing as we're leaving it. So the short answer is, if you want to know where that fish is or where that mark was, just touch it. it. Tells you where it was. That's the best way. Now the fish obviously could have swam away and I'm sure it did. But for those of you asking, you know, after the fish passes under the boat, where the heck is it? Well, our transducer is looking down. It was under the boat. It was the depth it says when it passes through the A-scope. After we leave it, the fish could swim completely different in a different spot, different speed could be gone. We could scare it away, who knows? But for a good guesstimation, just touch it on the screen. Look down here in the bottom left, 312 foot, and it gives you an idea of how far away from you are. If you want to put a waypoint on that, just go ahead and do your check, waypoint. And now we go to our chart. You're gonna go ahead and see that waypoint right there. And these machines are tied together. If you have your machines networked, you can set a waypoint on one and it'll set it on all the other ones that are networked. But that's basically my advice if you want to know where those fish are. Here's an Osprey. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. my goodness. <clears throat> Never mind. Oh, it's going to go off. There we go. Fish on, fish on, fish on. Fish. Go get it. Go get it. Fish on back there. You got three on. Oh, my goodness. <laughs>